So first of all, let me give you a, an introduction to the Industry 4.0 or the fourth industrial revolution. The first industrial revolution is the one that we're all familiar with from the um, 19th century, many steam driven processes. The second industrial revolution is what we think about when we think of the moving production line, which was really um, brought forward by Ford. The third industrial revolution is my common image for this is thinking about Homer Simpson at the nuclear power plant control panel, where he's using robotics and automation and computer controlled systems. The fourth industrial revolution builds on all of the three previous industrial revolutions and adds the extra element of digitalization, which means that we can create smart, interconnected and self-correcting manufacturing processes. Digitalization is where we can translate a lot of our learnings from the mining sector into manufacturing. There are so many opportunities for us to reshore manufacturing in a competitive way in Australia through digitalization, because digitalization means we can achieve a scale that we hadn't previously been able to achieve, and it's independent of labor costs. And through that scale, we actually create more jobs in the process. The concept of the digital twin, which I've got a, a visual of, was until a few years ago, it was really um, described in the vaguest of terms, and it was often confused with conventional simulation, conventional animations of manufacturing processes, and conventional computational simulations. Now we have a really clearly defined definition of a digital twin, and it offers enormous value. It enables us to push the boundaries of virtual commissioning, it enables real-time data analytics to improve production processes. And it will help us to shorten the time frame from an idea to a design to a prototype to an actual production part. We're going to see a change in the way that we think about manufacturing in that we're not just manufacturing products. We're actually generating value from the data from our manufacturing processes and exchanging knowledge in a secure environment. So now I'm moving from the digital to the physical and my favourite material being carbon. Just by changing the bonding between carbon, you can move from the hardest material known to man, diamond, to graphite, which is a solid lubricant. And then you can split the layers of graphite apart to create graphene, which was of course discovered at the University of Manchester in 2006. One um, brief aspect to graphene, we are just at the start of industrial applications of graphene and it's really exciting to see these as they emerge. There's discussions about graphene being an enabler of 6G communications and some work being done um, by Nokia Bell there in Germany. Uh, graphene is used in photovoltaics, it's used in energy storage systems and it's also used as a sensor. There is a coordinated effort to try and grade graphene in the same way that we've graded steel, we've graded aluminium, and we've graded um, carbon fibre. It really requires a deep understanding of structure property, structure performance relationships, and that relates always to the ultimate purpose of your graphene. You want to have a grade of graphene that you know is going to be fit for purpose, whether you're making a photovoltaic, a supercapacitor, or um, a graphene coated textile that's used as a sensing surface. So this photo was taken around about 2006. And at that time, um, I did a sabbatical at the University of Manchester. During my time at Manchester, one of the professors there um, had been to a conference in Hamburg and he, he came back saying, you know, there's this enormous wave of demand coming for carbon fibre and we don't have a, a mechanism to supply all of this demand. After much strategizing, we realised that we weren't just going to attract a multinational manufacturer of carbon fibre to Victoria, but we had to have some kind of offering, um, some kind of carrot, and that was the seed for Carbon Nexus, where we installed and commissioned an industrial scale carbon fibre manufacturing facility into Deakin University's campus. It's really important when we're looking at manufacturing across Victoria that we look at the strengths of Melbourne and of the regions. And in Geelong, we saw that there was an enormous history of wool and wool innovation. So moving from a, a natural fibre into a high-tech fibre was a relatively seamless transition. There's a lot of technologies that translate directly into those high high value fibres. So Geelong is, is now um, really the centre of the manufacture of carbon fibre and the manufacture of those raw materials. This is what we started off with at the beginning of the year, a rendering and a concept for an Industry 4.0 test lab. 
We were able to be on site just at the beginning of November. The building was complete and here we are with Swinburne's new Vice-Chancellor, Professor Pascal Cuesta, and leaders from CSIRO, including John Sanexides and Mark Asipa. I'm really excited about what we're going to be doing with CSIRO in Clayton because Clayton is undoubtedly the additive manufacturing precinct of Victoria. There's a, a very large aerospace focus and, and leading researchers both at Monash University and in, in Lab 22 at CSIRO on metal additive manufacturing. So adding our soft material additive manufacturing into the hard material additive manufacturing ecosystem with the digitalization of additive manufacturing being the key enabling platform is going to really create a significant impact in the next few years. So what's inside the building? It's a three-part process for composite additive manufacturing. This is Phil's latest technology. It's capable of depositing a layer every 15 seconds. And the feedstock is a tape that can be fiber, it can be polymer, it can be glass. This is a material science enabling platform that we're really looking forward to exploring and pushing the boundaries of. Because you can produce a tape and the tape is the feedstock, you're limited by your imagination on what you can incorporate into that tape. We're in discussions with our partners um, in Germany about embedding sensors into that tape. And we're in discussion with our partners in the United States who have really unique technology for dispersing graphene. And Professor Jeff Wiggins at the University of Southern Mississippi has a, a, a pre-preg line where he, he will be making tape for us. And he, he has developed a continuous reactor technology for dispersing graphene in those types. So we, we can't wait to get our hands on some of these materials. We are partnered globally in this particular project and we're very proud to be an international partner of ARENA 2036 at the University of Stuttgart. On top of the world leading research that they do at the University of Stuttgart, they also have an innovation ecosystem which is powered by plug and play and it's called Startup Autobahn. Startup Autobahn is an accelerator. It has deep integration with industry. I think what they're doing at the University of Stuttgart is really inspiring and part of the success is that connection back to Silicon Valley and the venture capital networks. And so that I think is the thing that we need to develop in Victoria where we have a connection to um, funding mechanisms that are not afraid of funding deep tech and understand that it takes a while before it will return value but then when it does return value, it will, the value will be enormous. So on Swinbird's side, we have the physical facility and the projects to develop that further. On the German side, they're working particularly on production technology, as well as creating through the Fraunhofer, a cognitive digital twin of our facility in Melbourne, which means that there'll be a virtual presence of our facility in Melbourne in Germany, which is terrific. So the outcomes from all of this work are that we're aiming to make parts smarter through digitalization. The digital twin of the process is going to be really significant and we're looking forward to doing the real-time data analytics so that we can work towards building a self-correcting manufacturing process. We are looking at reduction of waste, but we're also able to use hybrid materials because you can load different materials onto different spools. You can put glass fibre where you don't need the stiffness and strength of the carbon fibre, and you can add extra carbon fibre where you need reinforcement and optimise cost. Lightweight materials are really critical for improving fuel efficiency in the future. And we're also very much focused on sustainability. How do we recycle these materials? There's been some really exciting announcements by Boeing, who are working with a company in the UK called ELG, on reusing fibre from parts and reutilising them and repurposing those fibres. There's a really important role for universities to play in ensuring that the future workforce is ready to support industry in its digital transformation. And I'm really excited about what we're going to do next at Swinburne where we're going to look at what we've learnt from previous models of working with industry through our PhD students and really define and develop a new model for an industry-focused PhD for the future, where we can be developing those really creative engineers and scientists who are going to be leaving and spinning out their own companies and creating an enormous impact and economic benefit for Victoria.